Two deadlines missed, one to go from Ohio mapmakers. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the USA Today Ohio Network, Derek Clay, Democratic strategist, and Bob Clegg, Republican strategist. The final phase of the 2021 redistricting process now heads into its final phase. First, lawmakers failed to meet a September deadline to draw a bipartisan congressional map. Then the process moved to the redistricting commission. They ended their work, missing an October deadline. Now the process goes back to lawmakers, and the new deadline is November 30th. The commission never even presented a map drafted by the Republican majority. Lord Bischoff, is this what we expected to happen? So this is really no surprise. Once the state legislative maps came out in their form, we kind of figured the congressional map would, would follow the same course, no? Well, I think that hope springed eternal for a while there that uh, these new processes uh, approved by voters would, you know, take some of the politics out of the map drawing process. But then once the, the legislative process went as it did for the legislative maps, um, I think that uh, kind of punting it on the congressional maps was um, to be expected. Bob Clegg, do you expect to see a map very similar to the one we have now that, that heavily favors uh, Republicans in Ohio in the, in, the, in the number of districts they are favored to win? Yeah, I mean, it, here's the, the problem with this process. We still have politicians drawing political lines. And, you know, anytime that's going to happen, uh, you're going to have some game playing going on. Uh, we've seen this in other states around the United States where Sometimes it, it helps certain parties if you don't come to an agreement on lines, because um, in some cases like Virginia, it goes to the state Supreme Court, which is controlled by Republicans. So the Republicans didn't really want to come to an agreement. Here, you may have Democrats who are looking at a 4-3 Republican court that could flip, uh, Supreme Court that could flip next year. And they may just want to have four years of lines or lines that they can take to the Supreme Court with a new Democrat majority. So there's just a lot of game playing going on right now. Derek, Clay, what, what about that? Is there any way that, because now you need, now that it's in the, back in the hands of the legislature, the congressional maps anyway, need a lower threshold of Democrat support to get a 10-year map. What's the path for Republicans to get the handful, roughly handful of Democrats they need in the House and the Senate to approve a map to get a 10 year congressional map? Is there any way to do that? Uh, thanks for the question. I don't know if there's any way to do that. You know, I think uh, Bob was was right in his assessment that there's a lot of game playing going on over at the state house, And that's that's what happens when you have a supermajority in both chambers in the House and the Senate. Um, you know, this process has not been transparent. It has not been fair. And these are two of the things that, uh, you know, Senate President Huffman and, and, and co-chair Sykes wanted to achieve when they went out and got that, that ballot initiative, initiative passed in 2015. So, you know, we are seeing a lot of game playing. There is probably not going to be a 10-year map. And the, quite honestly, the Republicans have had a lot of time over the summer to have public hearings all across the state. That was not done. Everything has been done at the last minute. And now we're seeing the consequences of that. Derek, what, what, to Bob's point, the Democrats may not want to play, may, may not want to negotiate, may not want to compromise now in the hopes that things change in four years and they could have better maps in four years. Is that a part of, the, part of this process as well? You know, I think everything is on the table for, for the Democrats, uh, you know, because they're in the, the super minority, uh, they're looking at all options. I think that the Democrats were hoping that this would have been a more fair and inclusive process so that we could potentially get to a 10 year map. Laura Bischoff, we, uh, the depositions, because the, the state legislative map process, map making process is now before the state Supreme Court and attorneys for the groups suing lawmakers over those maps we deposed members of the commission over the past couple of weeks. And those transcripts came out this week and that gave us a peek behind the curtain as to what was going on. What's the main takeaway you got from those hundreds of pages of depositions you went through? 
Well, um, everybody should be thankful that there's reporters like Jesse Balmert who will actually read all those documents because it was um, not that much fun. Um, but the takeaway is that um, I think that Bob Cup and Matt Huffman really drove the process. Um, Mike DeWine, Frank LaRose, and Keith Faber all said that they had no hand in drawing the maps whatsoever. They didn't have access to the computer software program to draw maps or check to see if the maps that were being discussed were constitutional. Um, I think I read Faber's um, deposition. He said that the Democrats invited him into their little map making uh, lair um, to um, and walked him through like how they how they came to to draw their map. Um, but the same courtesy wasn't extended to them on the Republican side. And and you know Keith Faber, Frank LaRose, and Mike DeWine are all Republicans. And so it's. Um, it was remarkable to me that it was so driven by the two legislative leaders. Uh, Bob Clegg, that was the, the way this reform was designed was to put this statewide office holders on this commission to try to temper the self-interest of lawmakers drawing their own districts. That apparently didn't didn't really work here. Did we think it really would? <laughs> I mean, come on, these the, uh, Speaker Cup and President uh, Huffman were drawing their members' lines. So, of course, they're going to be in control of that process. Now, the statewides, um, you know, they could say to the Speaker and the Senate President, hey, um, unless you start including us, we're not going to vote for whatever plans you put out there. Now, they didn't because all three of them are up for re-election next year and they need the help of the Speaker of the House and the Senate President in, in, in those elections. So, I mean, once again, this is what you get when you put uh, politicians of, in charge of drawing lines. And then the Democrats are acting like, oh, well, we're open. We're, we'll, we'll let the statewides come in. Well, of course they will, because they know their lines aren't going to go anywhere. So they can show them to anybody and, and look like they're being open about it. But if they were honest, they, were, they would say, well, we're doing this because we want to look good. And we know that there's no chance that we're ever going to get our lines in place. So we got to look magnanimous about it. But that's why they, in the end, don't really want to have 10-year lines in place because they want to take their chances in a, in a Supreme Court that they hope they'll get control of soon. And just to prove the point that it's not just Republicans who draw strange looking districts, Illinois legislature early on Friday approved their maps. 14 of Illinois' 17 congressional districts are drawn to favor Democrats, even though that 40 percent of the state uh, votes Republican, at least in 2020. That's how it went. So uh, it happens everywhere. COVID in Ohio continues its decline. This week, Ohio's COVID spread rate was 359 cases per 100,000 residents. The COVID spread rate has been cut in half since its most recent high point in late September. We're still, though, at a very high rate of spread, and there is no sign that officials will lift mask mandates anytime soon. But schools have loosened up quarantine rules. Officials say the new rules will keep more students in class. Derek Clay, this is good news, especially as we're about to head, we are starting to head back indoors, that the case rate is coming down. When do you think officials may start saying the mask mandates should be gone? I don't know if that's I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon because uh, masks have been politicized. You know, the bottom line is the only reason why we wear masks in this COVID pandemic is to keep people safe. You know, and it's been politicized that it's a, a freedom of choice uh, uh, item versus a safety protocol item. You know, vaccinations. The reason why we have vaccinate have vaccines is so we can try to eradicate this this uh, this this disease that has killed so many people in our state and across our country. The sooner that we will, the sooner that we uh, try to do things that's going to take COVID out, the the quicker we can get back to some normalcy of life that we that we've enjoyed in the past. Bob Clegg, another thing that's happening is uh, local governments, state governments, are <clears throat> offering uh, cash incentives to employees to get the vaccine. Much of this money comes from the federal COVID relief fund, so it isn't really local tax dollars going to this, but it's tax dollars none, nonetheless. Is that the appropriate use of, of tax money? 
Um, well, a lot of these entities, whether it's the state or, or the cities, they're um, using uh, money that they got from the federal government as part of the you know COVID relief uh, bills that were passed. Um, yeah, I mean, I could see worse ways that they could spend it, but anything to try to encourage people to get vaccinated and I'm I'm OK with monetary. I was OK with Governor DeWine's idea of doing a, a lottery to, you know, give uh, people uh, free tuition and things like that. I think anything that we can encourage individuals to get vaccinated is great. Um, and taxpayer dollars, federal money like that, I wouldn't want them using local or or state tax dollars for something like that. But since the federal government didn't hand over quite a bit of money to uh, uh, local and state entities, uh, I think that's probably one of the best ways you can spend that kind of money. Yeah, uh, there were some people calling on the federal government to just to give a blanket thousand bucks to everybody gets a vaccine as a way to uh, boost vaccination rates across the country. Laura Bischoff, Mike DeWine has sort of exited the stage as far as COVID goes. We haven't had a briefing from him in a long time. He's off doing other things, uh, broadband and infrastructure and job stuff. Um, what's the What's the tenor right now at the state house of, of state lawmakers and the DeWine administration? Well, I think that there's still a lot of tension between the lawmakers and the governor. And um, maybe that's one of the reasons why the governor has stepped back and allowed his the, kind of the medical experts, Bruce, Bruce Vanderhoff, to handle the COVID briefings. Um, you saw, for example, um, uh, you know, there's been a fight over who's on the state school board. There's been a fight over, um, actually the governor has agreed to sign, I think, he hasn't signed it yet, but the signal was that he was gonna sign a fireworks bill that lawmakers wanted and that he had vetoed earlier in the summer. So I think the governor is kind of making uh, efforts to cooperate a little bit more with, with lawmakers. Not trying to stir the pot because the cases are on the way down, which will hopefully they, they continue. Uh, Derek Clay, you know, police officers around the country, New York, Boston, Chicago, uh, have been protesting vaccine mandates in their cities. Uh, Columbus does not mandate its police officers or any city employees other than Department of Health folks get vaccinated. Should the city have required, especially first responders, those who deal directly and closely with the public, get the vaccine? Well, you know, it's um, <clears throat> again, again, it comes down to, to choice. I think that the, uh, the, the mayor and the administration here wanted to see if folks were gonna voluntarily go out and get their, get their vaccinations, and, I, and a lot of them have done that. Um, but, you know, it's the, the, po the polarization that's been created from people that are vaccinated versus people that are not vaccinated has really caused a conundrum in our country. And, and the bottom line is everybody wants to be back to normal, but nobody really wants to do what is necessary to be back to normal. Yeah. And that means getting vaccinated. That means uh, doing your fair share of stopping the spread by, by wearing masks and protecting others. Yeah, 500 police officers estimated uh, have died from COVID in the past, in a, in a past year or so. Um, many more than died from gunfire uh, in the course of uh, duty. COVID is on the ballot in many school board races next week. Not the virus itself, but candidates opposed to how school officials have dealt with it over the past 20 months. Those candidates are running on the platform of parents' choice. They want parents to be able to choose whether their child wears a face mask or whether the child gets the COVID vaccine. Many of them are first-time candidates, but they have attracted party endorsements and a fair amount of campaign donations. Another issue this year is whether students should get lessons on critical race theory, which examines the impact of race on American history. Bob Clegg, you've been watching politics a long time. Have you ever seen this much interest and this much money going into school board races? Well, Mike, I'll tell you what, this all started a couple years ago with uh, George Soros and getting him and moveon.org and his uh, organizations getting involved with uh, local district attorney races and county prosecutor races. And that was an issue regarding criminal justice reform and bail reform. And they were seeing that, you know, if you get involved at that local level, uh, you can make have a big impact. And I think we're seeing the same thing going on here with the school board races. Now, we uh, actually have a uh, 
a governor's race this year in Virginia, which may end up uh, turning on whether uh, parents, the, uh, the amount of involvement that parents should have in, in schools and the school curriculum. So this has become in just the last year or so, a really big issue. And it's, you know, tied into the mass mandates at schools. It's tied into uh, critical race theory. Um, so no, I'm not really surprised that we are starting to see this kind of, uh, emphasis and spotlight on these local races. Derek Clay, I mean, the masks mandates and the vaccine mandates, maybe even critical race theory as a, as a curriculum is, is driving this uh, increased call for parental involvement. Is that necessarily a bad thing to have parents more involved in what happens in the school? Or is there a danger in a minority of parents dictating what the majority should learn and how schools should operate? Well, I, I will first say this. I, I am a advocate for if you don't like something, then you go and do something about it. And that's the beautiful thing about our country is that if you don't like uh, the way things are being run in your city, you can run for city council. You can run for mayor. If you don't like how things are being run at the state house, you can run for the state legislature. So the same holds true for these, these school boards, uh, these school board races. Now, Getting into why these folks are running, that's a whole different discussion that we can talk another day about that. Uh, but I do, just as people are being encouraged to run on these issues like critical race theory and whether people should be vaccinated or kids should be vaccinated or wear masks, I hope the other side of, of the, the spectrum sees that as a call to go out and run for these races as well. So anybody that wants change, you should run for office, but if but the bottom line is you better be ready for what all of that responsibility comes with. Yeah, and Lord Bishop, to that point, these are supposed to be nonpartisan races, uh, but yet when you get the mailers from each party, they have their endorsed candidates for city council and school board and township trustee. So it's really they aren't really nonpartisan, especially in this time. You know, I was just going to echo what Derek was saying in that um, there's like 2,600 people, candidates running for local school board races this year. And it's like a 50% increase over four years ago. And so, and nearly half of them are running for the first time. And uh, that, you know, that's some good news. It does show that people are getting involved and they're, and they're um, interested in contributing to their communities. The bad news is that there is this partisan divide and infighting uh, and sort of a nationalization of local local politics where they're fighting over wedge issues like critical race theory, uh, vaccines, mask mandates, et cetera. And the, I think the problem with that is that that will turn off a lot of people from, from actually being involved in local politics, that, that there is a distaste for uh, that hyper-partisanship for a lot of people. On the State Board of Education, the, the divide was within the party Two Republicans, Laura Kohler, the president of the State Board of Education, and Eric Poklar, another member of the board, have resigned this week. They both voted against a move to repeal a resolution that would have condemned racism and looked for ways, look for the reasons why there is a, uh, a gap between uh, achievement between people of color and white students. Laura Bischoff, what's going on there? Yeah, so the state school board has always been um, kind of an interesting place of pol political discussion and policy discussion. It is a, a 19 member board. Um, eight of them are appointed by the governor, 11 are elected um, by voters. And uh, on the governor's appointments, there's Senate advice and consent on the appointments. And um, after the George Floyd murder, uh, the board voted 10 to 7 in favor of this anti racism resolution. And um, the board makeup has since changed a little bit. And this, like I think it was last week, there was a, um, a vote to repeal that resolution and replace it with one that acknowledges that there are achievement gaps for minority students, but also condemned any teachings that quote, seek to divide. Um, and Kohler and um, Poklar each voted against repealing the anti-racism resolution. And word got out that the Senate was not gonna consent to their reappointments. The Senate did confirm three others who did vote to repeal the anti-racism resolution. 
Bob Clegg, is this something that the State Board of Education should be getting into this deep in the weeds? I mean, I can see condemning racism, and so I think you all can agree on that. Uh, look for shortcomings, look for why there's, a, why there's a, a gap, but this really seemed to get even deeper into curricula and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the initial um, mistake here was to get involved in this period, and but they did. And, you know, now you see, you know, trying to change what they did, what last year. Um, I think it's a perfect example of, you know, what exactly is the duties and responsibilities of the State Board of Education? I don't know if we know exactly what they are. I don't know if there's any clear cut um, job for them. Um, it, it's, you know, it used to be totally uh, elected body, but then uh, law was changed to include appointments by the governor so that the governor, uh, whatever the governor is sitting governor is, would have more, I guess, input into the Department of Education by having appointees on the board. But I'm not really quite sure exactly how the board is working as far as uh, setting curriculum and dealing with, you know, education issues here in Ohio. We have a department that I see as the driving force, not so much the board. Yeah. Derek, uh, it's a lot of boards, county commissioners, city councils, after the George Floyd uh, murder came out and passed these things. It's, it's odd that it's now become controversial. Well, you know, the, the, whole, the whole thing about criti critical race theory is telling the whole story. And, and, and that's, that's the point where people get hung up on. You know, everybody wants to talk about slavery in, in, in the, the, the history books or, or talk about it on the surface in the classroom, but they don't want to talk about the whole story. And so, you know, that's why we are getting into these debates about whether critical race theory should be something that should be a, a part of our, our curriculum in our schools. Um, and you know what? George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, it was, it was traumatic. I mean, it was just that was the that was the boiling point for just a lot of a lot of people. I mean, you know, African Americans and other minorities have been dealing with so many uh, bouts of racism for 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 centuries in, in this country, and that's not to say that this is not a good country, because it is. But the bottom line is, we we have some issues that we have to deal with that we have not talked about. And nobody wants to deal with it, and, and everybody wants to skirt around it. Mm -hmm. All right, one more topic really quickly. The pandemic exposed many shortcomings in our healthcare, economic, and government systems. Perhaps none more glaring than what happened with the state's unemployment system. Ohio State Auditor Keith Faber's office found the unemployment system lost $3.8 billion in less than a year. A half billion dollars were lost to fraud, $3.3 billion to overpayments. The audit blames the unprecedented strain the economic shutdown put on the system, but it also says officials running the system were too slow to spot the fraud and the errors. Laura Bischoff, is this a perfect storm or could this have been avoided? You know, this is these problems were highlighted by the DeWine administration and the auditor's office also conducted um, the audit that just came out. Um, it is, it, it, I think it is the result of a perfect storm. There was that big spike in demand following uh, the COVID shutdown. Um, they had a lot of aging IT systems. Um, there was an effort to move the money out quickly to those who were, you know, thrown thrown off off, off the work, and they needed they needed to you know make rent and buy their groceries and such. So the verification standards were a little bit looser, and so all of that added up to a big fat opening for uh, criminal rings to 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 um, capitalize on. And this isn't just a problem in Ohio. This is something that's been happening across the nation. And the, the federal um, bunch of federal law enforcement is looking at this. And I think it's going to it's going to take years and years before they ever figure out who did what. And the chances of recovering the money are pretty small, from my view anyway. Yeah, and the state has granted uh, folks a chance to apply for a waiver if they uh, mistakenly were overpaid. Uh, unemployment benefits. So let's get to our off the record final parting shots for this week. Bob Clegg, you're up first. Um, uh, a, a group called Ad Impact, which is a political tracking firm, is making predictions for 2022's election year. They're predicting that it will break all um, 
off of your records in that there will be 8.9 billion with a B uh, in aver political advertising on TV, radio, digital. All right, Derek Clay, your final thought. Issue seven is on the ballot on Tuesday. Uh, it is proposed to take over $81 billion of uh, city money out of its coffers if it's passed, all in the name of clean energy. It's a bad piece of, uh, it's a bad ball ballot measure and, and hopefully it will, will not pass. All right, uh, Laura Bischoff, your final thought. Yeah, I just urge uh, viewers to check out dispatch.com for an investigation on what's been happening in one of um, Ohio's largest prisons behind closed doors. Uh, we detail uh, deaths and injuries uh, following some violent clashes with, um, with prison staff and also problems with subpar medical care, blind spots uh, with security cameras and the case of a suicidal teenager who clearly needs more help. Yeah. Laura's being humble. That was written by Laura Bischoff, an excellent piece. Please check it out. Longtime viewers of this show know that I'm not a big fan of Beggar's Night. I love trick-or-treating, don't get me wrong. I just think it should always be on Halloween. On Beggar's Night this week, a little girl, probably about seven, dressed as a Disney princess, came to our door, took her candy and politely said thank you, and then said, in a very mature manner, I don't know who would ever have trick-or-treating on a rainy night. And I said, that would be the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. You should give them a call. And I gave her an extra piece of candy along with that civics lesson. My neighbors love me. That'll do it for this week. Thanks to our panel. Thanks to our crew. I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.